this is Rick. Sorry I can't take your call right now, so please leave a message. In the bright sun, we rose with shiny faces and played and danced, sang in love. Had no worries, no possessions. We chose partners and had babies. Our babies had babies. With cats, dogs, cars, homes, stuff piled to the ceiling. All around us was abundance. Where had it all come from? There was much laughter and joy, along with heartbreaks. With tears, we buried our loved ones. We defended the ground we cultivated. Seasons came and went in a blur. So soon it came, so soon it would pass. Soon I will watch my final sunset in humbleness and take my final leave. My shadow shall cast no more upon this earth. But what a time, what a place, what a time it was. I wrote a song called Summer Love in 1966. It took us eight hours to record this. Okay, I'll do it. Now? big in this area and we, we knew we hit the big time we were listening to the KOTE which was the radio at that time and they have call in requests play and somebody called in to say play summer love by Napoleon first of relatives and we all just we did it we we're on it we're, we made it we made it and we actually really didn't <laughs> wound up opening for the Dave Clark five and I'm going, wow, you know, waiting for people to go, wow. And they go, who were they? But anyway, they were quite famous at that time. I'm starting to remember a lot of things that I'd forgotten that um, would come back to me about these places we played in. And you sound just like the record. And that was the thing. If you sound like the record, you were great. You sound like John Lennon. Oh, I made it. <laughs> she never came. It's true. I do. I love her so. Summer's long. Don't let her go. It's true. How I do like you. How I do like you. They started drawing when I was out on the west coast of mountains and stuff and of course my mom was always encouraging me about art and stuff and she says you need to be in an art school so I started out in graphic arts. I wanted to be an illustrator. Then I was interviewed by a scout for Minneapolis College of Art and Design so I was accepted there and went back there to fine arts. Of course the academics I had no interest in and I found out that I'm the best teacher. The life of things in front of you are the teachers. They started drawing. I came obsessed with the life of Van Gogh. He didn't need teachers or anything and I kind of went with that uh, learning and suffrage type situation it got me in a little bit of trouble but it also enhanced my life and I had other jobs to pay the bills and stuff but I always kept at it I was a basement artist or a kitchen artist and all of a sudden all of a sudden I got this very interested in sculpture or casting the pieces got bigger and bigger and then I 
had my first commission in 83 at the Pioneer Home. And I made this sculpture of Grandpa and Grandma holding an umbrella with the water kind of coming down and it uh, reminded me of my grandpa and grandma. I was diagnosed with heart disease at 33. I went in the hospital, they did angiograms, which were a nightmare in the 80s. I've, if those people that know what angiograms are have had 21 of them. Two of my veins were plugged up and they said, we can't let you go. We gotta do open heart surgery tomorrow. I'm 33 years old, invincible. Hello? At that time, they always blame it on lifestyle. It wasn't, I find out later on when I went to the mail that it's a genetic situation. And then it attacked my uh, carotid arteries and so far I'm still here, but it's, it's slowly closing. This one plugged up totally. This one was 80% closed. So they put in a stent that failed and that's where it's been and it's gone down. From 35% to 20% is going down and this is closing up too. So I'm on a mission to get it all done. The thing is that was funny is that this vision made things, it wasn't blurry, it would make things smaller. So if I was looking at you, your left side of your face was normal and then your other side was shrunk. And I would, I would keep laughing at my wife because why are you laughing at me? I says, you're not, I can't explain it. It was like Picasso, um, on steroids, or his other brother, Ruprecht. The uh, optometrist that was giving me these shots, he says, you're the first one that's ever said that you enjoyed what you saw. Anyway, it saved my eye. He says, if I don't do this, you're gonna lose your eye. That's why I have the hat and stuff. I'm very sensitive to lighting. And um, actually it's a fashion statement or something, I don't know. I did inkings, that's where my illustrations came in. I was introduced to the pitograph pen, which is a mechanical pen, and I was able to um, do these very fine, detailed pieces of men riding seahorses that lived under the sea and um, airships. Did a lot of that. I even sent a piece to Jacques Cousteau. I did a drawing of a trigger fish. I put a bunch of stamps on it, and I said, Jacques Cousteau, France, the Calypso, Jacques Cousteau, the Calypso. It was the name of his boat. I never did hear from him. I no longer do those, but um, it developed into the other art that I'm doing. I have about 50, 60 sketchbooks. And I actually, sometimes I work off of what I drew 20 years ago, I'm going, what the heck? What was I thinking there? And so I'd enhance it a little bit or erase something or just put it on the easel and away I go. I found this in a sketchbook and I went, wow, I, I would like to try. I, I didn't even come close to it. It doesn't matter. This is what came out. But what I was referring to is like, a lot of times I'd go out looking for inspiration you take a chunk of it home, plop it on the table. And this is part of how I work.
But anyway, this is all my pastels. These are scientifically laid out. I don't know how I keep the palette going because this is how it is all the time. And yet I seem to be able to keep that color scheme going. Pastels are extremely easy to work with, but I can get what I want really quick. And what they do is they represent my experiences, what I see. It's a very spiritual thing. Fish out of water is my theme. There's always a fish floating around that shouldn't be there, but it is. And sometimes I have them underneath the pastel coming out, peeking out. The colors, everything is, it's all a spiritual reflection of my inner self and what I've seen, heard, and felt. Even though some people don't understand my work and some people say I keep looking at it and it, I keep seeing things. And I like that. I don't know if there's a real, I call it assemblage art because that's all I did was assemblage. I became very obsessed with antiques. And I love history. And I started going to, um, they had a lot of good rummage sales, a lot of uh, flea markets, auctions galore. I had all this stuff and one night I, I was experimenting with glue and some of this stuff and uh, too much chocolate, too much coffee, and um, pretty soon I started assembling some of this stuff. Nonsensical, it, it, uh, take something from that and something from this, put together you got something totally different with wheels. You put wheels on anything, it becomes something different. I've been doing these things for about 30, 35 years, almost nonstop. We go into this room where all the assemblages are. And uh, this is one of my favorite ones for the moment. They kind of assemble themselves. I'm there to help it out. There's no rhyme or reason. And that's the fun of it. This is called Bonneville's Bonneville Bob. It's a new type of uh, propulsion system. Uh, it's a model of it. He turned it on, they haven't found them yet. I love going through antique shops. My eyes wear out pretty quick and I have enough to keep me busy. But once in a while I go in and it seems like that piece finds me. And that piece will inspire me to do something with it or keep it as it is and just stare at it till I can't stare at it anymore and then get into something else. Just look at it, oh man, how deep. that's so cool.
I worked at the state hospital. I started in 78. I was there for about 20 years and I would connect with a few of the people that were in, influenced or liked art and he'd come up and show me stuff. So I took one guy, his name was Wally Jerzyk, he's long gone, but um, I worked with him. I love, I wish I had that piece. I don't know where it is, but we had, I actually, I drew the face, he helped me with the body. It was rolled onto the wall in that part where he lived. And the next morning, the night person came up to me and he says he's been up all night. And he had it all colored. Wally was an awesome guy. But there was a lot of beautiful people there as well. The clients were so eager to love and accept you and trust you. I walked on pins and needles for quite a while. I was scared. Fear. Um, when's it gonna happen? When's it gonna happen? And I found out that most people in 10 years had another surgery. And I said, there's no way. The surgery I had was horrible. It has, everything was metal. The catheters and everything. Now there are these little sliver things that you can't even see. It has changed so much that you're in there for probably less than three days and you're out again, heart surgery and all. However, I'm done. I'm done. They didn't offer, they can't even do a re, uh, transplant. I'm done, that's fine. I'm okay with it. I kind of like it. I don't have to make any decisions. And uh, I got over the fear of having a heart attack. My parents took me to Cayman Islands. I started snorkeling again. I started diving. And I kept going. Sea Cortez was my go-to place. In fact, when I'd go way down as far as I could and just sit there and look up and see part of the sun shining through, it was the most peaceful feeling. Sometimes I feel cheated, but at the same time, I get a chance to have people go, oh, wow, I love that. I'm not gonna let, it keeps me alive. It keeps me going, it keeps the passion going. I'm not gonna let it beat me. There's a hole in my head, hole in the head, I'm walking around and I should be dead. Hole in the head, hole in the head, look around, I should be in bed, but I'm still here. Yes, I'm still here, and I've said. I don't have a serious bone in my body. Except, I don't know why my heart did this, but I think there's a, I have a feeling of what it, what the, what's going on. Uh, the, the creator wants me to slow way down and take a look and see where and where have you been and what you've been doing. And I've seen some pretty incredible things. The wind comes from the east Blows to the west Over the mountains To the California coast Once in a while, whether I want to or not, somebody will come in and buy one of my art pieces, my pastels, and what I like is their expression and their reaction to one lady recently came in 
didn't know what she wanted, but she had seen something my sister had had and had one piece left and she was just, the excitement on her face was, you know, that, just that moment. We came all this way for that moment. It was worth it. It was wonderful. It's not about wanting to be famous or anything. I want to be recognized as an artist that gave something back. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram, online at 967cram.com.